introduce you the next talk. It's going to be by Jonas Geisler. Um, he's going to talk about Power2x and um, dive a little bit into carbon capturing and utilization. So I'm especially interested in this since, you know, um, our planet is burning and we're trying really hard to save it. So I hope uh, Jonas can give us some hints about how that might be possible. So please give a warm welcome to Jonas. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, a warm welcome from my side as well to my talk. And uh, yeah, as already announced, I will talk about uh, how to make things from electricity uh, or power to X. Um, and the outline of my talk is first, um, what is the idea behind power to X and what does this mysterious X might stand for? Um, then I want to talk about carbon capture and utilization, like a group of techniques which fall under this large uh, word of power to X. Um, then I will want to talk about the energy sector a little and uh, the chemistry sector, so where this could be applied and, and uh, why this might make sense to do this so in the hopefully very near future. Um, so yeah, um, the phrase power to X, um, basically the idea is when we're generating renewable energy, um, we produce at certain times sufficient electricity, at certain times not sufficient electricity, and at other times surplus electricity. And this surplus electricity, the idea was what to do with it. Like we have it, we have it as a resource, um, do something with it. Um, and there is where the first word you will find when you're searching for power to X terms comes into the game, which is the trivial solution, um, which is, sorry, power to value. So make something valuable. Um, and we'll see later on that uh, the idea of using surplus energy won't be enough, but uh, that's basically the idea. Uh, by the way, power in that case usually is electricity, so um, not that you're confused, power refers always to, to, to electricity. Um, then when we got this idea, like power to value, um, we can ask us the question, like, what do we need? And there comes the, uh, the next group of uh, terms we can use uh, into play. And the first one I want to present you is power to power. So now you might think that's stupid. We have power. Why should we do something to make power? Uh, but that's basically referring to all the energy storage things, like storing to uh, make the grid stable for times where we don't have sufficient uh, electricity supply. Um, and use it then. Um, the next is heat. Um, heat is uh, one of the main fields besides electricity where we put energy in, so why not make heat with that power? Um, third one, mobility. Um, same thing, we have a certain uh, field where we need a lot of energy. Let's bring electricity to that field. Um, the next thing, chemicals. That will be something I will talk a lot about. Um, because carbon capture and utilization is mainly about chemicals. Um, yeah, can we use that electricity to produce chemicals in an efficient way and in a renewable way? Um, and the last term one might find is uh, food in that field. One might find more terms, but this is basically what is the most common. Um, so maybe we can also use it to produce some food. Um, yeah, um, now we have uh, our needs in a basic. The, the question is now, what products can we actually make? Um, and there we come to a very often heard term, power to gas. Um, this mainly refers to methane and uh, hydrogen, where we have another terms, power to methane, power to hydrogen. Um, so let's produce gases which are storing energy for us, and we can uh, apply them for certain things. Um, very similar uh, power to fuel or power to liquid, which is essentially the same. Like when referring to fuels, uh, it, by that term, we very often think of liquid fuels. And when referring of liquids, we very often think of uh, fuel applications. So that's, uh, that's rather similar. Um, and the next one would be uh, syngas. Um, syngas is uh, the mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, uh, which is very often used in chemical industry. So um, I will talk about that later. Um, power to syngas um, yeah, is what's meant with that. 
uh, you can find power to ammonia. Ammonia is one of the chemicals we are producing in very large scale, and uh, which is very energy demanding. We're burning a lot of fossil fuels to, uh, fuels to make um, ammonia. Uh, and the last one I want to show you is protein, which is a rather interesting idea as well to make proteins directly uh, using that energy by some, some chemistry. Now, how they are in interconnected, so all these three energy applications refer mainly to gas and fuel, a little to syngas. Uh, the chemicals, of course, um, like when we're speaking of chemical products, that's all chemistry. And food is mainly ammonia due to fertilizer production and uh, protein. But I won't talk too much about food, ammonia, and, and uh, proteins. I will mention ammonia at some, uh, a certain point, but that's not the focus of the talk. Um, now, is that new? And I would say, no, that's just like modern buzzwording, because uh, power to power, we have since a, lo a long time, this is a, a hydro pump station from the 30s. Um, power to heat, you might know such devices from your grandparents. Um, power to mobility, um, you, this is a bus from the 40s. And uh, power to chemicals, this is a, a chloralkali electrolyzer, so producing chlorine gas and sodium hydroxide solution uh, from the 1920s. So we have power to whatever already. Um, the thing is just in times of climate change and uh, an increasing amount of renewable energy, it becomes more interesting and uh, new technologies could be implemented, uh, but the general power to something terms are nothing really new. Um, now coming more uh, to uh, uh, carbon capture and utilization, um, what we are doing in our uh, energy sector usually is we take fossil carbon, then we make some fuels out of it, we make one of those uh, fields of uh, energy we are using, and in the end we end up with uh, CO2 and water. If we think of the chemical sector, we're doing the same. We're making commodity chemicals, so like the large-scale chemicals produced in, in really um, megaton scale uh, worldwide. And from those, we're producing all the fancy products uh, we have uh, around us. And at the end of the life, hopefully, we burn them or we degrade them to CO2 and water, because if we don't do that, we end up with waste, which is even more problematic, usually. So um, this is very linear. We're coming from fossil fuels and we're going to CO2 and water, and I guess that's not very new to you. Uh, but carbon capture and utilization now means that I capture this uh, CO2 and water again, and I utilize it and make exactly that fuels and commodity chemicals to have a circle. Like, no more CO2 should be produced, but we are just driving it in a circle. Um, very um, important from the beginning, we are not reducing CO2 as long as we are not producing way more products, as the products are already there and we're just bringing new products, we're just lowering the amount of new CO2 emitted. Um, to make that clear, a lot of uh, startups say something like uh, negative CO2 emissions by carbon capture and utilization. You need to really look into the, to the detail if they store somewhere the carbon or if they um, really do um, yeah, carbon capture and utilization and then they usually have no negative emissions. But I come to that uh, later again as well. Um, now, this looks nice, but till now it's a perpetuum mobile. So, for, of course, we need to put in the renewable energy and we could either do that directly by uh, uh, putting it into the energy sectors and uh, using this uh, energy there, uh, or we could just drive that cycle around by putting it into capturing CO2 from point sources we can't avoid, um, or from, uh, the di from the air around us, which is a little more complicated because the concentration is very low, but still possible, um, and also possible on a large scale. And in the end, hopefully, we get rid of this fossil carbon, but just having this cycle ongoing. Um, when we look at exactly the same thing from another uh, point of view, um, we come to, uh, uh, for example, this energy scale, and we see different carbon products and, the, uh, and oxygen combined uh, have a certain energy level uh, stored within the chemical bonds. And what we usually do when we, when we burn them, which happens uh, at a certain point, as I said, uh, we 
kick them over the activation barrier, and then we uh, throw them all the way down the hill till we end up with uh, um, CO2 and water, which is really what for chemists, CO2 and water is quite stable. So we're really down at the bottom of the energy somehow, which is good because we wanted to get this energy out of the reaction, um, but which also is a problem because now we need to bring that back up again. Um, and the question is, how could we do that? How does that work? Um, can we just heat up CO2 and water and all our nice products fall out again? That's sadly not that easy. And at first I want to uh, talk about uh, techniques which um, are already like have a technology readiness level very high. So which are, could be implemented in, in large scale reactions kind of already, like minor optimizations still needed, but, but we could do that today. Um, and therefore, uh, we take apart the, the water and the CO2 part, and the first step we make water electrolysis. Um, just to remind you, like water electrolysis, you put two electrodes into a salt solution, um, you apply electricity, and uh, from uh, the anode you will have uh, oxygen evolving and from the cathode you will have hydrogen evolving. So far so easy, uh, like for chemists we know that optimizing that is not that easy, but it's known technology, we can still make it better, but it's out there. Um, so now we have hydrogen and oxygen, like we already produced the oxy oxygen uh, we put in in the beginning, now we want to have our product, and therefore we combine this uh, hydrogen and CO2, and then we go over certain reactions uh, which are downhill in energy. So um, we are getting energy out of that again. Um, but why? Because the products are uphill. That is because we put in more hydrogen from the beginning to produce again water. So we're splitting water and using that water to reduce the CO2 to our products and we form water at the same time. Now, you might have seen such uh, pictures uh, in, uh, in school at a certain time when people were talking about catalysts. Mm. And a, a catalyst, from what I hear from people who uh, tell me what they heard in school, is this strange things which makes uh, erection fast. Um, or some, some people or, uh, still remember the thing that lowers the activation barrier. Um, but what does actually happen there? And I want to make the experiment to get you a better glimpse of what a catalyzed reaction looks like um, by visualizing it. And uh, therefore, we take this picture. We have that very nice catalyst surface, which is very ordered, uh, and which is not the re reality. For the experts, this is also not the outcome of some uh, a simulation or whatever. It's just a visualization how such a reaction could look like. Uh, in the micro scale on the surface for, for single molecules uh, and atoms. And um, now this CO2 is a linear molecule uh, somewhere in the gas phase uh, or in a liquid phase, that, um, which makes it more complex, but we're just looking at the CO2 here um, uh, above this catalyst surface. And if we have the right mater uh, material, what could happen is that um, the CO2 adsorbs to, the, to one surface atom or to a group of surface atoms. And um, you already see that I uh, uh, drawn the CO2 molecule band, um, so it's not linear anymore. And that might be already uh, one step where the activation barrier is reduced because it's now accessible for reactions from some angles which were not there before and the electri electron density is different and, and all that. So that might be even uh, more reactive than before just by absorbing it to that surface. Um, now we want to react it, uh, this with uh, hydrogen. Now we, so we put in a hydrogen molecule and some catalysts, for example, are capable of splitting that hydrogen molecule where it would never happen uh, in normal cases. And uh, this might look like this. So we force, uh, form something we call surface hydride. So we have single uh, hydrogen atoms sitting on the surface. Um, and they are split up at a rather low temperatures. Um, and now we have that in very close proximity on the surface, and what uh, could happen is that one of the hydrogen atoms just jumps to one of the oxygen atoms, and we formed a surface carbonyl group. 
This carbonyl group already is our first reaction. We have reduced carbon dioxide to something not really useful yet, but we already did it. Um, next step, the, the other hydrogen could jump to the very same oxygen. Um, so this is not stable. This oxygen has three bonds in that case. This should, in, in most of the cases, break apart. And this is exactly what happens. Um, and we form uh, water, which is in the gas phase, and we have carbon monoxide uh, still bound to the surface. Um, and now we could do all kinds of things. So um, if the uh, surface keeps that CO uh, absorbed, we can react it further and make uh, one carbon containing small molecules like methane, methanol, all that stuff. Um, or we can um, have another carbon monoxide at the same surface, very close, and then something similar could happen like uh, where the hydrogen atom reacted with the oxygen, but the two carbon atoms in a close proximity now react. And that's where we form like longer carbon chains, and there we make complex, uh, more complex molecules. So not really complex, still like two carbon atoms, three carbon atoms, ten carbon atoms in a chain or something. Um, but yeah, we form, form uh, products. Um, and the last thing which could happen, this catalyst is just not capable to, to keep that carbon monoxide on the surface, and it desorbs, and we produce carbon monoxide, which could also be fine. Um, so I hopefully I could explain you now a little more how this catalyst thing might work. And um, now the question is, what are their reactions which we can use? And the first thing you already seen, water electrolysis, is in that case the first step. Um, you've also already seen the so-called reverse water gas shift reaction where we produce carbon monoxide uh, from CO2 and hydrogen, even if it, in reality on the real catalyst this might look a little different, but uh, similar to what I've shown you, this could happen. Um, now I said carbon monoxide can be a useful product and I come back to the synthesis gas or syngas I already mentioned. And with this in different mixtures we can do a lot of things like uh, mixture one or two to one uh, produces LPG, so liquid petroleum gas. This is what you have in your camping cooker bo uh, uh, bottles. NAFTA is a certain fraction you usually get when you distill crude oil, which is very useful in chemical industry. Um, diesel, which is also something like that. If you put in um, uh, like two to one, uh, you get, for example, methanol, ethanol, dimethyl ether, or gasoline, and uh, with a mixture of three to one, you end up with uh, methane, or so-called SNG, which is synthetic natural gas, So, um, we, uh, which means exactly the same, basically, because uh, natural gas contains mainly methane, synthetic natura, natural gas usually is methane. Um, so, um, here we are already uh, very happy. We have a three-step process and we produce all kinds of things we can use. Um, the problem is by having a lot of steps in a reaction, we multiply the efficiency and thereby the efficiency goes down. Um, so we are always very happy if we can produce things in few steps. So there's, for example, the reaction of CO2 and uh, hydrogen to methanol directly on one catalyst in one step. So we only have the efficiency loss of one step instead of two steps, the reverse water gas shift and the corresponding syngas reaction. Um, so we might have an increase in efficiency uh, by doing that if that reaction is more efficient than the two steps combined. Um, same pr uh, principle with the Sabatier reaction. There we take CO2 and hydrogen and make directly methane without going two steps. Um, and, uh, one uh, reaction I want to, to mention here, even if it's not carbon capture and utilization, is the Harbour-Bosch reaction, because we, in pr principle it works the same. We could make the hydrogen from, from water electrolysis and react that with nitrogen, and um, there's exactly where the um, re reduction in producing uh, um, ammonia in a way that is more sustainable comes in because um, usually the hydrogen and in chemical industry today is produced by a lot of uh, fossil fuels so you burn fossil fuels uh, uh, with uh, too little oxygen to fully, fully burn it and you get a lot of hydrogen out of there uh, so um, if we would just use uh, 
um, hydrogen from water electrolysis, which is more expensive today, but would be way more sustainable. Um, just to give you one further example, is um, I want to point out on this direct methanol synthesis um, for a second, uh, and we form methanol. And the, the picture you see is the George Ola plant in Iceland, and it's named after a very interesting person um, who uh, made the concept of a, a methanol economy. So, like. Basically, like our today's economy is a oil economy where we produce nearly everything we have around us from oil. Um, uh, he proposes an economy that uses uh, methanol as the central resource, and that's why they called this plant after him, because they are producing four kilotons a year um, of methanol, or at least they have the capacity to do so. Um, this might seem not too much uh, when looking. Uh, at 100 megaton a year um, worldwide methanol consumption, but keep in mind that's just one plant, and we also don't have just one plant producing methanol today. Um, and uh, it's one of the first plants who does exactly that, um, producing CO from CO2 and water by the use of uh, quasi-renewable energy in form of geothermal energy um, uh, producing methanol. Um, for the people who are interested, a typical catalyst which you could use for this process would be uh, a combination of copper and zinc oxide. Um, I'm not sure if they are using it, because they uh, for sure don't tell which catalyst they are using, but this would be, would be something typical one could use. Let's go back to this picture where, you where I showed you all these steps we're going through uh, in the uh, processes uh, I've shown you till now. These are the processes, like I said, which are on, on a technology ready, a readiness level that we could do that today, basically. Um, uh, but you've seen it's a lot of steps, and I told you that a lot of steps sometimes is not good. So let's look a little more into the future, and um, could we go like one step? And uh, there's something promising, and this is actually the field where I'm working in, in a more detailed way. Um, in my PhD, and uh, this is electrocatalytic CO2 reduction. So you've seen uh, the same picture as uh, in the slide before where I explained water electrolysis. Um, so what do we change? We put in CO2, and then for sure we need to change the catalyst material. I don't know if you've really seen that, but the color of the one electrode changed. Um, and uh, what will happen then when we have the right catalyst? Um, we get directly our renewable carbon product, or like, yeah, hydrocarbon product. Um, and what could uh, be those products? Um, the first one, formic acid. Formic acid is a chemical which uh, has a certain role in chemical industry, several kilotons a year. Um, it's, it's not too large, but we can produce it that way, and already kind of efficient. It is not like industrial level yet, but, but that, that works. Um, and we can do the uh, carbon monoxide, which I also said uh, before that is useful. And there I know that um, uh, some German companies are right now build, uh, trying to build a commercial plant to do exactly that in that step. I won't mention companies because I don't I want to make stupid advertisements, but there is something going on. Um, other products we could, do, uh, could make is uh, methane and ethylene. Um, methane, again, synthetic natural gas, um, and ethylene it would be the real uh, thing, because ethylene is, I think, the uh, um, chemical made from, um, from oil, uh, with, like the largest chemical made from oil, because um, we're producing a lot of polyethylene as plastics, and we can use it also for also, uh, other kinds of things. We, uh, so we, uh, it has a very large variety um, to make things uh, out of ethylene. Um, but methane and ethylene, to be honest, are more on a scale where it works in a lab, um, and it's still not really sure if we can bring that to industrial scale. But it might work. Um, and yeah, like I said, that's what I'm trying to work on, uh, or being part of a large community working on that. So, um, 
now I've talked a lot uh, about uh, the processes and the chemistry behind it. Um, let's see, can we use that? And like I said to you, I want to talk about the energy sector. And just to give you an estimation, um, the uh, primary energy consumption of the world is something like 600 exajoules a year, which equals something like 167 petawatt hours. That's what we are using in form of gas and oil and coal and renewables, like all the things we put into the energy sector in the beginning. And um, the three uh, different things I told you before, electricity, transport or mobility and heat are roughly a third of each. Like in Germany, we uh, need a little more heat um, because of uh, cold winters um, and in, in other parts of the world we have a little more electricity. So rough estimation, one third each. Um, so now the question is, if we can mainly produce renewable energies in the form of electricity, uh, how do we bring that into that field? And uh, we can start with something which is very well known, mechanical storage and uh, pumping up uh, water a hill. And we can calculate roughly um, one kilogram of water. We're pumping uh, uphill for 100 meters and we roughly come out at something like 0.3 watt hours which are contained within the water, um, yeah, more uphill. Um, that's something and that's useful. We've seen that people are doing that with hydro pump storage, um, but we might put in more energy and then we can go to thermal energy um, uh, storage. And uh, now we take the same kilogram of water and heat it up from 25 degrees, roughly room temperature to, to, to boiling. Um, and we see uh, we come to uh, something like 87 kilowatt hours in the same exact same kilogram of water. Um, this is rough a, hundred, a factor of uh, two orders of magnitude. Um, so now we can go to chemical storage, which is the thing I'm talking to you since uh, roughly half an hour. Um, um, and there we can put in uh, 3.7 kilowatt hours by splitting the water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, this is again something like uh, uh, two orders of magnitude higher. Um, that's the reason basically why you don't see cars uh, driving around with hydro pump storage because we couldn't just bring in enough water and height into the, into the, into the car to make that but we, you only have chemicals or electrochemicals driving a car. Um, now, when we go to uh, uh, electrochemical uh, storage, um, I want to show you this uh, so-called Ragoni plot, which uh, draws the energy density by weight, so how much energy in one kilogram, um, uh, over the energy density by volume, how much energy in one liter. Um, and if you are not too familiar with uh, the uh, joules up there, there is one megajoule is something like a quarter uh, kilowatt hour. Um, now let's take the absolute standard which is lead acid like car batteries um, which is down there. It also has uh, its applications and weight wise it's still the largest energy market just because lead is heavy um, but we're still producing mainly lead acid concerning weight. Some of you might remember nickel cadmium, uh, which is prohibited uh, due to the toxic cadmium. Uh, uh, the better thing is a nickel met a metal hydride. That's what you know from like normal, these cylindrical battery shaped um, rechargeable batteries. That's nickel metal hydride. And then of course, lithium ion technology. We can uh, bring in a lot of energy into uh, uh, these batteries and you all have that in uh, a whole lot of devices. But if that's still not enough, um, we need to go uh, to an, a different scale. Um, and we put all the batteries down there. Um, and now we come to hydrogen. Hydrogen is somewhere in that region. Um, and why is it in such a broad region? It's because uh, we have 
um, hydrogen storage in materials, uh, which is essentially a sponge sucking up hydrogen, but we have that additional material in the storage, so it becomes heavier uh, and is low in the energy density by weight. Um, we have the gaseous uh, uh, and the uh, at 700 bar compressed and the liquefied, so uh, that's what makes up this, this square. Um, but uh, we see now we are very good in energy density by weight. Hydrogen is very light. Um, but by density, we, there's still place above there, and there is where the sea-based uh, materials come in. And for, uh, to, to give you some examples there, we have uh, methanol down there, we have gasoline up there, and that's also why an electric vehicle doesn't drive that far, but is like three times as heavy as a normal car. That's exactly the thing, uh, um, why gasoline is so good. And from my personal perspective, I can't imagine a jet flying with batteries because they would be too heavy. We need some, some uh, fuel that drives them, um, which is lighter and denser. Um, so, yeah, that's why uh, the, the carbon products are very interesting. Um, and uh, another thing um, uh, why carbon products are very interesting is because we know how to handle them. We have a large infrastructure all around the globe to transport them, to store them, to supply them to, to the applications. We know what to do. We just need to install capacities to produce them uh, from a renewable way. Um, but where are the downsides? If we're uh, looking at the downsides, uh, we come to that graph, and I really want to uh, emphasize uh, the work of uh, the group of Andre Bardo, which do a really great work in making these life cycle assessments um, of uh, um, uh, uh, these technologies. And what we see is um, the global warming impact uh, measured in kilogram uh, CO2 equivalents, so like greenhouse gases uh, in general, um, of coming from certain products we are producing via carbon capture and utilization techniques. So we have this orange dotted lines of methane, uh, we have uh, this um, um, violet line uh, is jet fuel uh, and different kinds of things. And um, it's drawn over the global warming impact of the electricity we use to drive that process. And um, the vertical uh, line is fossil diesel. So if we are above that line, by driving that carbon capture and utilization cycle, we're producing more uh, uh, greenhouse gases uh, than just using fossil diesel. Um, and then we have this, um, no, yeah, the, did I say uh, uh, horizontal line? I think I said vertical line. Um, the horizontal uh, line is the, the, the uh, fossil diesel. The, the vertical lines are um, uh, the grid mixes of uh, certain countries, the, the intermediate grid mixes, for example, the one r right out there at something like 370 um, uh, gram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Uh, is the EU grid mix uh, proposed for 2020. Um, then we have the EU grid mix for 2050, which is still not sufficient to produce anything. Um, we have Swiss, uh, Sw Switzerland, with this, which is on the border. Um, of There could be something useful. Uh, we have France, uh, which are very low in global warming impact of their electricity because they're using a lot of nuclear power, which is a total different discussion if that is uh, by any means helpful, but, but they could do something uh, on that field. Um, and uh, as, at the best, we have Iceland, which has really high amount of uh, green electricity in their grid. And we have the wind benchmark, which is the technology, which is, which is also not zero, because we are producing, for example, a lot of concrete to, be, uh, to, to build the windmill, and that produces a lot of CO2. Um, but it's still the best technology we have uh, global, global warming impact-wise. Um, so yeah, it, mo it makes only sense if we have a lot of very green electricity. Um, going to the chemical sector, um, we have a graph that is slightly more complicated, um, but it essentially says, uh, it shows the mass flows um, from fossil fuels 
to the 20 largest uh, um, chemicals produced from fossil fuels usually, uh, which have 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions um, of the chemical industry. Um, so that's like a model which can refer to basically the whole um, um, chemical industry, um, and they modeled it for these 20 chemicals. Um, and we see these fossil fuels are uh, over different processes split up in what I said before, ethylene, methanol, uh, polyolefins, so plastics, um, aromatics, I didn't speak a lot about them, but or essentially not, um, and ammonium. Um, which is not a, a carbon-based, but as I said, we put in a lot of fossil uh, fuels to, to produce it. Um, now, what is the alternative of this thing, which is the proposal, uh, uh, proposed um, mass flows? So, like, the size of the line refers to a mass flow. Um, uh, to this mass flows, for, uh, which are proposed for 2030, um, for, by just using fossil fuels on. Um, I said, when I showed you methanol, I said something like uh, methanol economy, and uh, they made a model, uh, it's again work from, from the group of Andre Bardo, um, where they um, basically use methanol as a central chemi uh, chemistry, because they say this is high in uh, technology readiness level, so um, we can, could do that right away. But if you see that right, uh, um, the outcome should be the same. Like, we're producing a certain amount of chemicals uh, in 2030, maybe, um, and n not, uh, um, it should not depend on, on the way we produce it, how much we need of it. So, actually, we can scale that down here. So, if we make that and capture the carbon dioxide, um, and use hydrogen, by the way, here the hydrogen, uh, you see the hydrogen mass flow going in, this comes from water. This is why a lot of water comes out of this reaction, which is the gray part uh, on the top right part of the, this methanol pathway. Um, and we would uh, need to put in even more water and split it at the beginning, because some of the water uh, for sure ends up in our products. That's why we are doing that. Um, so we would need to put in a whole lot of water uh, to, to um, make that, and we would have massive mass flow, so we would have a, um, by many factors, or by a huge factor, larger chemical industry if we would do that, because we would also need uh, plants to capture the carbon dioxide and so on and so on. Um, and now the, the exact same question, does that make sense? And here is two models, so I showed you the uh, high TRL model, which is, again, technology readiness level, so can we do it today, or is it something we could do maybe in future? And uh, the orange area is the, we can, we can uh, maybe do that today uh, area, and it's the same graph plus, uh, as I've shown you in the, in the electricity part, or in the, uh, sorry, in the energy part, just the other way around, like zero that time is on the, on the right side. Um, and we see, like, again, we would need to have a whole lot of uh, renewable electricity, which is really clean, not, not a grid mix um, from today. Um, yeah, now we can uh, uh, come to another uh, graphic, like, how much electricity would we need to do that? Um, and this uh, graph shows like the, the different lines, the colored lines are different um, um, uh, global warming impacts of the electricity I put in. So zero would be the best uh, thinkable. So I have uh, zero emission electricity I put in. So I go down that line and uh, it's drawn of the additional electricity we need. So how much do we need to install extra to what we have today? Um, and uh, on the sides, the scales is cradle to grave greenhouse emissions, which is, from my side, the meaningful uh, thing, because that says, like, how much greenhouse gases do I emit uh, from producing the, the chemical till degrading or burning it at the end of their life? So how much extra CO2 comes out? And uh, the other side is cradle to gate, which is more interesting for a company. Like, uh, I take CO2, and um, make something with it, how much do I uh, uh, produce from 
uh, starting to my factory gate where I ship the product, and that's also why cradle to gate emissions can be uh, negative, so we can store CO2 there, and they cannot be negative when we're looking at cradle to grave, at least not if we're burning the product in the end of the, uh, the lifetime. And we see uh, we need a lot of electricity. Um, the, the scale down there is in petawatt hours. And uh, just to give you an, a number, the today's generation of electricity in total, so not renewable electricity, electricity in total is something like 24 petawatt hours. So we would essentially need the same amount of electricity um, as we are producing today to uh, produce the chemicals uh, in future in a renewable way. Re keeping in mind that we also need the uh, renewable electricity to make, um, to make heat and mobility. Um, and there is the point where I say, like, there's, this is nice technology, and we can do a lot with that. Um, but uh, the question is, um, so from my point of view, we cannot reach that. So we need definitely to reduce. So we need to reduce in all the, the ways. We need to reduce chemicals. We need to reduce all uh, kinds of uh, energy usage, and that on a severe level, because we just don't have enough energy uh, to make that, uh, or we are not, from my perspective, not able to produce in a sufficient time scale enough electricity to do so. Um, but we could still do something and um, keep our like luxury level at least at some level for the next uh, time and the next generations. And at the end, I would just want to show you very briefly where I think this energy might come from. Um, and I want to show you that map. Uh, and this map uh, is the, uh, basically the sun shining on the Earth, like the, uh, in, in watt per square meter, uh, is that, that colored scale. Um, and there's, a reason, uh, there's two reasons why I put that map the way you see it. First, because it's anyway useful to change perspective from time to time and not be in the center of the world. Um, and the other thing is that um, today it's very often that um, the southern hemisphere depends on the northern hemisphere for a lot of uh, reasons, but in that case we depend on the southern hemisphere and if we want to make that in a social and fair re uh, way and not in a, uh, a neo-colonial way, we uh, essentially need to go to them and ask them, would you please generate uh, energy carrying products for us because we need them uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise our society uh, will break apart because uh, this drop in luxury we can't just can't afford for our society and what I would do uh, in, in, in large scale is uh, putting there uh, down there concentrated uh, um, solar power plants which are really able to produce very high amounts of electricity in a fairly easy way uh, on, on, on small, small scale um, and you can produce like all, all day and night if you, because you can uh, store the heat in, in, the, in the liquid salt um, uh, and you could place like plants there which produce for example methanol and ship it to us um, like uh, yeah in, in that way and uh, yeah with that I uh, think uh, I have some few minutes left but I'm already uh, at the end of the uh, talk, and I thank you for your kind attention. Um, but uh, for the qu uh, questions, I want to just start something. You, you see the source here, uh, climateclock.net, uh, clock to just show you how severe the discussion is. Yeah, and with that, again, thank you for your attention, and um, I'm happy to try to answer your questions. All right. Uh, since there's a longer break after this talk, we can take a couple of questions. So if you have a question for Jonas, please come to one of the two microphones in the room and ask a brief and concise question so we can be quick about it. But maybe there are actually no questions. Or maybe one. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, great talk. Um, how are we going to capture all the CO2? Because that infrastructure isn't there yet. 
Um, there is infra so the infrastructure is not there, um, but the technology is there, uh, especially when concerning point sources, um, like uh, going to some factory which produces CO2. There we need to keep in mind that deal between uh, renewable electricity, uh, like what is the footprint of our, our electricity and what are we producing, but we have some processes like, uh, for example, concrete production where inherently in the process we are uh, producing CO2. That could be one option. And there are um, some startups around the world who are making direct air capture and who are quite efficiently, uh, especially if they have a uh, heat source or a weight he waste heat source around, uh, they can very efficiently capture already today very pure CO2 from, from ambient air around us. So the technology is there, the infrastructure is not. All right, then we're just going to take that last question, please. You mentioned that we need about the same amount of electrical energy that we have today for this power to X. So what amount of power uh, of electricity do we have renewable installed today? Um, I actually have no idea about the worldwide uh, installed electricity. Um, I know that we are in Germany where we always say we are very good, where we actually are not, like our footprint is something around 450, if you remember the scale before, that's on the far outside end uh, of these graphs um, in like the intermediate value over the year. Um, yeah, um, I think there, there is one page I can uh, recommend to you, electricity map, where they collect data like this, uh, and you can see like how green is the electricity in different countries. Um, but yeah, basically, I don't know. I know that the Chinese are producing a whole lot of renewable energies, even if they are still building coal plants, but, but they are really going on, uh, on with that. So it's getting better, but it's still way too slow. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you so much for taking the questions. Thanks for the great talk. And that concludes our Q&A session. Thanks, Jonas.